this is going to be in voice. I hope everybody can see. Um, if you're having trouble, there is a red box immediately to my uh, my left. It says, get your fees. That includes uh, my contact information, a full transcript of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the president uh, has a slide, so if you want them, grab them. And it also has your choice of star coffee mug or if you're game, a glass of white wine. And, and is pacing the transcript. Thank you very much. And I thought we'd start off with, um, and this is, oh, but I see we have a great uh, show already, and I will be monitoring the local chat. Let me pull that up right now. Oh. And uh, I thought what we'd start with is, um, again, this is entirely optional. If you want to introduce yourself, many of you I already know. If you want to put in local chat, your second line name, uh, well, real life name, maybe your, um, what, what school you're associated with, uh, what your interest in the metaverse is, um, just feel to start putting that information in there. And the reason I'm asking for that is I want to feeling as to, uh, I know where some of you are, like, we have a couple of people here from Colorado, well, you guys I appreciate you showing up. And as it shows on my first slide here, I have already done this lecture twice. It came out 25 minutes. And so minute time block here. Got plenty of time for questions and answers. And uh, like I said, I will have the nearby chat open. So as I'm going through the information I want, free to drop a comment, a question. If you're going to put a, a question in there, please start with caps um, so that I grabs my attention. Okay, good. I see already Bill has put in his information from Montana State University. Awesome. Um, I have been to Montana, great state. Okay, so I presume it's... Uh, it, it, so we can get started. Um, and like I said, the topic of this talk is a teacher-created metaverse, the Dinosaur Ridge Project. I am Dr. Miami in Second Life. I am CEO and founder of Educational Virtual Worlds. I'm a research associate at the Virginia and the faculty uh, of geosciences at Virginia Tech. I thought right up uh, that what we should do is talk about goals. What is it that uh, employers, uh, including myself, look for when we hire people? In fact, I'm going to be hiring five people this summer for a project uh, at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. And the things that I've heard from employers and also at my school is, that they're looking for is we want people that are critical thinkers, that communicate, not just in real life, but also in um, online. Um, people that can collaborate, again, not just in real life, but also online. Can they use online? Can they use tools to work with people in their life? Uh, what about digital citizenship? That's an important concept. And, uh, of course, we also want people to be creative. Uh, the beauty of this is that virtual multiplayer, uh, virtual world forces all of these. And I already know from seeing some of the other uh, proposals for talks, not everybody is a huge fan of virtual reality when you're talking about the metaverse. Um, I'm going to give my reasons for why. I did include virtual reality in my presentation. Uh, there were some strong reasons, and it was also expense associated with it. Uh, but anyway, that is coming up. Uh, like I said, if you're just joining us, uh, please feel free to put information about yourself in the 
monitoring that. If you have any questions or comments as I'm going along, feel free to post them there as well. All right, so last year I approached um, both LV and Ellie and said um, I really wanted to uh, use the Virtual World's Best Practice and Education Conference as an opportunity to share an upcoming project that I was working on. In fact, if you look at my profile, what I did was I created uh, a Google document that had all the information about the Dinosaur uh, Ridge Jurassic simulation in a Google Doc, and I just put a link in my profile so that people could be looking what I'm doing and sort of see where I was going. Um, and it was more than just dinosaurs, okay, involved with this project. What I wanted to get into was how do you create a multiplayer VR virtual world almost from scratch? Uh, what is the cost of creating these simulations? And I got all kinds of numbers when I start, first started planning on this. What are the best practices? I mean, this is the virtual world best practice in education. What are the best ways of implementing reality worlds in a classroom? And all of these questions are going to be answered. It took me a year to create the sim and then demo it at the Virginia Museum History, and then I went back to my high school and tried with students as well. But I've got some really great data that I'm really excited to share with you. All right, but before we get into all that, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is is how I got the content, okay, for my metaverse. Um, I did my PhD work uh, out west in Wyoming and Montana, and uh, then I eventually work in Virginia. And I spent about 33 years uh, with my wife and son in Virginia, uh, teaching at a high school there and also at a college. And in 2021, I retired and decided that I was going to honor a pledge I made to myself to get back out west. So in the fall of 2022, right after about with COVID, um, I went out west to Dinosaur Ridge in Denver, Colorado, and got a great reception from the people out there. Um, if you've never been to uh, Dinosaur Ridge in Colorado, if you can ever get out there, I strongly recommend it. It's one of the most classic, iconic dinosaur uh, areas in the United States, I would say even in the world. And this is a picture that I took when I was out there, and you see some dinosaur bones that are still in the rocks. Dinosaur Ridge is fa uh, famous for um, the first stegosaurus, the first apatosaurus were found here. Uh, while uh, when Dinosaur Ridge was first uh, operating, it had 15 different uh, quarries that were set up. The Transcontinental Railroad had just been established, and dinosaur bones were being taken out of Dinosaur Ridge and shipped to the east. Dinosaur Ridge is also famous for its dinosaur footprints. Hundreds of dinosaur footprints have been described um, at Dinosaur Ridge. And by the way, the, the black impression that you see there is actually charcoal uh, that was put in the footprint to make it stand out and, uh, against the, the weight of the rock. Otherwise, they're, they're somewhat hard to see. All right, so after getting a fantastic tour of Dinosaur Ridge from some of their geologists, I did a presentation for the staff. Uh, I got to go in their offices and show off a VR simulation of the early Cretaceous that I had done at the Virginia Museum of Natural History in July of 2022. And Jeff Lamontag, I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name, the director of Dinosaur Ridge, saw the VR simulation, got really excited, and said, could you do simulations for us on the late Jurassic and also the late Cretaceous? And I said, absolutely, I would love to do something like that. Uh, he said, you're welcome to uh, get help from our staff. Uh, and Erin LeCount, who is one of their paleontologists, uh, just was very generous with her time and provided me lots of information on uh, the dinosaurs during the Jurassic, uh, what kind of other fossils are found out there, what the environment was like. Um, I also went on a tour of the Morrison Museum, which houses many of the Jurassic dinosaur fossils that are found in Colorado. 
Um, a lot of the specimens have been removed from the quarry and are either in the Morrison Museum or have sh been shipped to other museums. All right, so when I was talking with Jeff, uh, one of the things we talked about was what kind of software what did they want developed? And Jeff said yes to everything. Um, Dinosaur Ridge was fantastic in the sense that they said, yeah, we want to have single player versions of the software available so that they can be put on display in kiosks, both at the Virginia Museum of Natural History and also in the Discovery Center in Denver. I was told that was going to be coming up in another couple of weeks. I want to do multiplayer VR versions of the software for the Dinosaur Festival in July of 2023 at the Virginia Museum. And also, I want to go back to my old high school and do it as well. Um, and then, to be honest, I knew that a lot of schools can't afford gaming rigs and VR headsets. So I also wanted a web-based version for use on mobile devices and also on Chromebooks. So that was developed as well. And uh, the, interestingly enough, the web-based version allowed for both single and multiplayer explorations, explorations of this virtual Jurassic field trip. All right, so what kind of software? If you know me, obviously my weapon of choice is Unity 3D, um, which is free until you make, I think, $100,000, which I'm not worried about anytime soon. Uh, the other thing that I did was um, I, I used a pho Photon Unity um, a network for the backend support or server support for the multiplayer. And then there's another program called the Extremality Plugin that I got for 25 bucks um, that uh, is on the Unity Asset Store. That is one of the best deals that's out there on the internet. I paid 100 bucks for the Streamality plugin, um, but it's now available for 25. So it's you know like a quarter of the original cost. And what Extremality does is if you can create a single player version of a program in Unity, you just put the Extremality software into your version and within about a half an hour to an hour you get um, chat uh, avatars all the cool things that we love seeing in a virtual reality uh, virtual world program for the chromebook web and mobile versions um, i went with 3d web worlds and uh, if you just go on the website uh, you can get into the virtual worlds for free for the most part they will want you you better yet create an account that gives you a few extras. All right, so let me hit right up why I decided to use virtual reality support. Uh, basically, um, it was through the discussion. Uh, Dr. Adam Pritchard at the Virginia Museum, uh, I did a simple uh, prototype. And one of the things that Dr. Pritchard liked about virtual reality is you immediately get a sense of scale of how big these dinosaurs are, whether they're really small or really large. When your avatar is below it, you get a feel of how big this thing was uh, back in the Jurassic. And I just don't get the same sense of scale when I'm doing, you know, just a, a simple PC version. Um, the other advantage to using VR is it is immersive. You're sort of shut out from the real world that's there, so you can focus on what's going on in the simulation here. Okay, so like I said, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was cost. And um, so here you see a list of uh, the expenses that I encountered while I was trying to do this project. Uh, so basically, the overall my overall budget was somewhere a little north of two thousand five hundred and forty dollars. So some of the expenses that I ran into included uh, hotel and food for the festival. I was around five hundred bucks, which was gratefully paid for by the Virginia Museum of Natural History. There were some server costs associated with the web-based version uh, that was paid by Dinosaur Ridge. Uh, there was Extremality plugin, like I said, 25 bucks. I used Unity a lot. 
off for free uh, year for the most part. So I was happy to pay professionals for their work. So the malls took about a little under 500 bucks. I also wanted a good environmental model that was around 80 bucks. And then my many thanks to uh, the uh, techs that worked with me on this project. I, I can't say that enough. I did hire two animators and production costs to make this software was a little over $1,400. Uh, this is headsets and so on. Um, each station was around seven that's a little bit high, seventeen hundred bucks. Uh, we got the best and you can get the gaming rigs and uh, the VR headsets a little bit less or less price. So I would say bucks somewhere in there. Okay, for the um, for the total cost. Um, and I think this is this was a really good deal uh, because when I first started planning the simulation, um, people were telling me, "Gosh, a simulation, what, what you're talking about, could easily exceed a quarter of a million dollars if you were to have a, a, a game studio do it." Um, you know, as teachers, we tend to like to want everything for free, and unfortunately, that's that's just not going to happen. Um, if we want really good content, really good virtual uh, worlds in our in our schools, um, I think somewhere in the range of a couple thousand dollars to develop uh, a new project like this is very reasonable. Um, I remember when I was teaching at the high school, if I could get enough teachers interested, that the school would be willing to pick up the cost of developing uh, new resources for the school. In fact, when I went back to my high school, there were so many the teachers and students that were interested in the project that uh, there is a plan to get a cart with at least one or two of these gaming rigs with uh, virtual reality headsets on them, which I'm really excited about that my former school is uh, willing to start putting some money into this. Um, and one of the comments that I would make here is that other teachers uh, you know, when I go to conferences or in services, often what I see is, you know, conferences that are just dedicated to teaching, okay? Like, for example, um, uh, VISTI, uh, Virginia Cyber Technology and Education, or Unity will run Unite conferences just for technicians. Or there will be conferences just for content area, like the Geologic Society of America, runs just conferences for geologists. In fact, they're all just coming up in April, end of April. And it would be really nice if we could have more of an interplay of content experts, technicians, and teachers at a conference to design software like this. And I was just talking with Helena earlier about that possibility. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the simulations uh, that I developed with Dinosaur Ridge and for the process uh, that I went through here. So uh, this is one of the first multiplayer sims that I came up with. You see Aaron LeCount on the right, and I'm on the left there. And we're running around this virtual world, and there are uh, there's an Allosaurus facing away from us. And the first thing that uh, Aaron did when she she got there was that uh, she said it's it's wrong. <laughs> people going through these exhibits um, and it can't be like a normal program where you get to play it for hours. Three to five minutes is what you've got. So I put a timer in that basically watched the time for each guest and after I think it was four minutes it timed out and said thank you for playing the sim. Please hit the reset button so that the next guest can try it. And that seemed to work pretty well. All right, so um, one of the things, like I said, I tried to release multiplayer versions of the program uh, which with each iteration, so that allowed people in Colorado to log in with me so that we could explore the environment, take a look around, and see what we thought. And Katie Bradley is one of the staff members at Dinosaur Ridge, and she looked around, and she said, hey, some of the dinosaurs aren't moving. 
And she said all of them should be rigged, all of them should be animated. So, like I said, I went out and hired uh, two technicians, Yvonne DeBandy in South Carolina, and a guy named uh, Goon, like it is last name Ron, um, in Pennsylvania, and they did a fantastic job uh, animating these uh, these animals in Blender. And yeah, if you've ever played around with Blender, it, it can be difficult. So it's it's well worth hiring a technician, as I found out, uh, for that job. One of the things that um, that I talked with Erin about is she wanted me to adopt a how-do-we-know-what-we-know model when it comes to uh, dinosaurs. So uh, the folks at Dinosaur Ridge were... Um, gave me a lot of freedom to go around Dinosaur Ridge, take pictures of whatever I wanted to, and include them in the simulation. So as you're running around, you're not only seeing the dinosaurs, but you're also seeing these pop-ups that tie into features at uh, Dinosaur Ridge. And one of the things that really impressed me when I was out in uh, Morrison, Colorado, were these things called Brontosaurus bulges. You have these big, heavy dinosaurs that come around just pounding the sediment, and uh, their feet actually go in the sand and create these spherical structures known as brontosaurus bulges. Um, so I included them not only in from pictures, but also in the software you, where you could see, look behind the dinosaur, you'll see some of these bulges that were present. So it was really handy working with experts to, to make the software as realistic as possible that students could learn as much as they could. All right, now, last year, as you know, was the big year for artificial intelligence, and I'm also a huge fan of GPS. And as I was going around developing the software and very much concerned about uh, time, um, I was running around, there was this one dinosaur called Ceratosaurus, and I had trouble finding him. And I knew where I put him in the software, but when I logged in, it was just a pain trying to find him. So what I decided to do was to use the artificial intelligence libraries in Unity to help me out. So the first time I did it, I logged in, and I said, okay, as soon as a guest logs in, I want the Ceratosaurus to find me, which it did, and ate me. So I'm going, well, that's not so cool. So the second time around, I, I'm going to add GPS to the AI library. And this, this actually was easier than I thought. Basically, what I did was... I used Euclid a Euclidean distance formula, and basically what I said is that whenever the dinosaur gets within five meters of me, to stop, and so I could take a look at it, and that worked well. And then the third time I was playing around with it, I said, I, is this really realistic? So I said, how far could a, a dinosaur really see in, back in the Jurassic? And I guessed maybe 20 meters. It turned out to be a really good guess. And I talked with Alex Hastings about this, uh, no, uh, excuse me, Adam Pritchard at the Virginia Museum, and he said, yeah, based on the anatomy of the dinosaur, and maybe there was fog back then, 20 years is probably a good distance. So as the guest is walking around, the dinosaur does nothing until you're within 20 meters of it, and then comes charging at you, and then stops, so you can take a look at him, and then you click on him. Uh, on the uh, on on the pop up, and you can and move on to the next dinosaur. All right. Uh, one of the things that I talked about at the very beginning, the importance of communication, was really highlighted as I was doing this project, and I was trying to do a um, I was trying to set up a meeting between the experts, uh, the educators, and the technicians. And one of the things I quickly found out is we use different tools. What's it? expecting that. Uh, technicians used gaming, uh, used uh, Discord. Uh, educators and scientists prefer Zoom. And so I set up the meeting and said, okay, everybody, here's, here's the Zoom link, and the techs are going, we don't know how to do this. So I said, look, it's not hard. You just click on it and it takes you right into the meeting. So I was able to con con uh, convince the technicians to go with Zoom. Uh, what helped is that Aaron LeCount out in Denver is a gamer, and she's used to Discord. That was fantastic because I was able to connect then the technicians with Aaron. So if they had a question about how a dinosaur was supposed to move, they just sent her a message on Discord, and then she got back to them really fast. So there was a lot of 
good discussion going on there between the techs and the experts. And as a result, we got some really good realistic dinosaurs. Uh, surprisingly, I had more problem emailing the teachers when I wanted to go back to my school. I said, hey, I, I need a time, a day, when would be good for me to come? And emails were really slow coming back to me. So I eventually made a separate trip. I went back to Virginia. We planned everything out, and, and it went just fine. All right, so July 21st, 22nd of last year finally arrives, and uh, the, the Dinosaur Festival at the Virginia Museum is ready to start. This is a huge festival. Uh, the Virginia Museum is a pretty good-sized building, but to give themselves even more room, what they did was they converted the entire parking lot into an exhibit area. And they actually got permission from the YMCA and the church next door to park cars there. So all the parking in the museum went for exhibits. And they set up these big white tents, and they put out generators um, uh, in the area so that uh, they had more room okay, for the exhibits at the festival. And here's my team. So uh, we stopped for a picture in front of a Triceratops skeleton. And I was lucky to get uh, Darian Bradley, who's a college student at Virginia Tech, who was also on, uh, on my computer club in high school. So he not only knew dinosaurs uh, from college, but he also knew how the software ran. Brandon Delp was a paleontologist from Roanoke. He came by. I'm the third person in the picture. And then we were really fortunate to get Logan Howell, who's a paleontologist from the Virginia Department of Energy. So I got the dream team. I wanted to get five people, but with COVID still around, I had to deal with only three. I'm glad I didn't try and do this by myself. And I'm going to give you some reasons as to why teachers need help to implement these sort of projects either at a festival or at a, uh, in the classroom here. And this is what our table looked like. Um, so here you see um, we had a nice big table. We had two gaming rigs, plus we had uh, VR headsets that were associated with those, uh, those gaming rigs. We also had a big screen TV so people that were waiting to try them could sort of see what the software was like. There was also a separate PC on the left end there. Um, I'm going to explain to you why we need at least three computers. And it turned out that's, that's a pretty good number uh, for this festival here. Um, I was worried about, just a sort of side note, I was worried about sort of the Disneyland effect, that we might have so many people showing up that there would just be lines, you know, going on forever. And that never really happened. I think maybe at most there was like a five, ten minute wait to try and snap, strap on the headsets. And that was it. And here's the big surprise uh, that we got hit with very quickly when we start doing this. PC set up, you know, for younger children, and then I expected, like, adults and teenagers to do the VR headsets. And up to all the parents and said, we see that you've got young children, most of them are elementary school age, and we said the manufacturer of these headsets does not recommend that kids use them under the age of 13. Every parent we talked to said, I don't care, strap it on my kid's head. Um, and we did, just to see what would happen. And the kids had a ball. Um, so here, here you're seeing um, uh, two children. And in fact, we had a lot of parents with like two children, you know, like a brother and sister or two sisters, whatever. So the kids to go into VR. Um, yeah, my kid is only going to be wearing it for four minutes, so, you know, sort of <laughs> how, how much damage or how much can they do. And, and I, I will say, since it's brought up, let me say a little bit about this. I just, there's, there's no evidence that hurts or damages the eyes. Um, and I did talk to my doctor also before um, I went and his number one concern was germs on the headsets. And uh, so he said, look, get a bunch, go to CVS, get little call prep swabs. And this is where having three people helping me really helped out. After each student used it, we just 
wipe down the whole inside of the VR headset uh, to prevent uh, germs. So I, I think that went really well. Shall probably more the emotional and, and brain influences. Um, but yeah, the the kids absolutely loved the, the VR. In fact, the kids just added all the more to it. It was hot that day, no doubt about it. In fact, that was one of my own said you're going to be outside in the tent and we'll have a generator you know for power and so on it was 90 degrees the first day it was 80 the second and you can sort of see the wilt there uh one of the great perks at the festival we had a good experience some people wanted to use them even longer um but we again we limited this to about four minutes okay getting back to the heads to the cooling fans so i decided to try a couple of different ones at best buy so i, I bought a cheaper cooling fan for 40 bucks and uh also got some i got another one for 70 bucks and the big difference between the two cooling fans was the one for 70 allowed you to elevate the laptop so that you could get more air cooling under it it was well worth the extra 30 bucks um because uh, one of the things that was nice and one of the things that we did was we were constantly monitoring the gaming rigs and uh, the one under 70 did a much better job keeping the temperature of the laptop cooler and they did have fans inside the tents that were trying to cool off the air and here's the biggest payoff. I mean, some of the guests just had a ball there. You can see this on that kid's face. Um, had a parent bring him in, and and he just liked doing the uh, the the PC version, and still had a great time uh, with it. Uh, the majority of the children did prefer playing the sim in VR and multiplayer. And here you see two uh, two sisters with the headset on and one of the things we did by the way you notice that they're using their hands to hold the the uh, vr headset up uh i had so many people trying to do this i didn't have a lot of time to keep adjusting the, the straps on the headset so i encourage the kids hey use one hand to hold the headset up and then use the other on the controller and if you learn nothing else okay from my talk here is i want you all to realize um, how popular VR multiplayer virtual worlds are. 80 almost 80% of elementary school kids preferred the VR multiplayer game. Some of them, even, even if they were offered just the PC, said, no, I'll wait. I'd rather strap the headset on and do it multiplayer. Um, so that was that was an interesting result. Didn't, didn't expect that to happen, but it did. So um, the uh, the Ready Player One, elementary school kids are ready for Ready Player One. And there were some adults that, um, you know, that had a ball with it as well. Here's a couple, uh, a man and a woman that came in and strapped the headset on, and you could see the smiles on their faces as they're running around and exploring uh, the simulation. Um, somewhat, Shiloh, she's asking about adult feedback. I got some. Um, the, I think the number one question that I was asked is, can this be played at home? And the answer is yes. Um, we did have a web player version. It, it doesn't have all the content as the VR multiplayer one, but um, the answer is yeah. And some, what we did was we had like a QR code with the uh, link to the web-based version. And while some adults were waiting, um, they scanned the QR code with their camera and went to the to the 3D Web Worlds uh, site and were able to play it on their phone while their kids were playing it on the VR headset, which I thought was really cool. And here's a picture of those two adults running around in the Jurassic uh, looking for different dinosaurs. You, you see a Stegosaurus on the right there. All right. I brought up about the five main goals, the five C's, as we call them. And I want, I want to hit those because they're important. And one of them is online collaboration. And how do we go about um, uh, implementing that into a virtual world? And in my case, it's remote procedural calls 
also known to Texas RPCs. And I didn't know much about them until I talked to one of the techs, uh, which is Kevin Tweedy, who actually developed the extremality. He explained it to me. You all know about RPCs. It sounds fancy, but it's not. We're using them right now. Okay. If you look at Electra, she just uh, punched some text into the local chat. And what that did is convert to a series of packets that were sent across the network, across the Second Life servers, and we all get them. Okay, or I'm getting some IMs here. So I've got one from Blue and one from Supernova. Um, where they put text into a chat box, and it was sent just to one computer. Well, it turns out that you can do more than just send text around a server. So, for example, you can send graphics, you can send events. So, um, as this couple was going around, they were exploring the dinosaur sim in the Jurassic. When one of them found a dinosaur, not only did they get the pictures, the graphics, and the text, but it was also sent to their partner so they could work together in exploring the simulation. And that was really cool because it speed up gameplay. They could find more um, dinosaurs, or uh, you the words, Jeff. Uh, they could make more discoveries within a limited period of time. And, and that's pretty much the way that uh, dinosaur explorations and expeditions work in real life, too. When one person finds a, a discovery, whether it's out in Colorado or New Mexico, whatever, that information is quickly spread to, uh, to other people. All right, now, many of you know in Virginia, we have a governor that is very much concerned that need to be part of their kids' education. So we set up a separate PC aside from the two grades in our headsets. Parents could sit down and watch what the kids were doing. They could log in to the same simulations the kids, and they could watch what the kids are learning. And so, when one of the kids, one of the children, found, say, a dinosaur, it would pop up on not only the their partner but also on the parents' computer, so they could see what was going on. Which I thought was a cool feature of this. And here you see an example of the two kids running up to an Allosaurus and getting information about the, this dinosaur. And here's an example of a parent that was playing with his son, and, and they were running around and using RPCs. They were able to find all 14 of the discoveries. They found everything that we wanted them to uh, within a very short period of time. And uh, again, look at the smiles on that father's face. He's having a great time with his kid. Um, in total, over 300 guests tried our simulation. We think it was probably closer to 400. We were losing track. We were trying to keep track of how many kids were actually trying to do it. Um, but uh, that was about what we got. We also had some people uh, playing on the um, uh, web-based version. The problems that we went into with this metaverse where we're using them at uh, the festival. Well, the big one was the controllers. And at one point, they were, um, uh, they just died. And we quickly figured out that we burned through the batteries. So we had a lot of fresh batteries burning them to make the controllers kept working. The other issue, other big technical issue we ran into was HP uh, at this cords they have to connect and if they don't connect tightly guess what you lose power to the gaming rigs and running vr on battery not a great idea <laughs> uh, all of a sudden the graphics start to get all confused and whatnot so it's much better to have a really good tight connection with um uh with the gaming ring okay so after um after we, i did the presentation at the you know, it was really cool. People got ex the kids got excited, but I was wondering if they were learning anything. So I went back to my high school and wanted to know about try and see if they were learning the content. And Jane's asking any questions about data collection, especially invert sharing biometric data. We didn't uh, didn't collect any biometric data. Um, in terms of privacy, um, I collected a lot of data at my old high school. 
I got permission from every parent before I did it. Um, I never share like the student's name or their individual scores, as you're going to see. I only do like bar graphs to so that um, you know their privacy is secure. So I go back to my high school and got permission to try these demos with um, um, with uh, the students and um, also did a survey. And just like the elementary school kids, um, there was the simulations were very popular. Eighty percent of high school students also like the VR multiplayer uh, virtual world sims. All right, students also felt in the survey that it helped them learn better, almost eighty percent. And unfortunately, that one uh, wasn't actually accurate. Because when I went through the scores, and the way I did it was, when I was at the school, students were given a pre-quiz during attendance, and then I put them in the VR headsets multiplayer, and they got to run around, and then I gave them a post-test. And I only saw scores go up on average 10%. So there really wasn't much of a change just due to putting the kids in VR. And Shao was asking, is there a gender difference among high schoolers? In terms, are you asking in terms of the survey results, Shiloh? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. That's something I can look at. I still have the results here in New York. Uh, remind me after this. I'll check it out. I don't think so, but I can look. All right. So, um, well, actually, at the high school max, I didn't limit them to four minutes. If they wanted to stay in the simulation longer they could have. I, I'll basically ask, everything they needed was in pops and like reading when they're doing a computer simulation like this. Um, what I found, because again, we need practices here. When I, as the teacher, went in with the students, in other words, when an, um, I stood behind them and what uh, the kids were doing in the computer simulations, and I would point out, hey, look at that dinosaur. Uh, looked at you know, the environment. There's much bigger improvements in terms of scores. And, and uh, question here. Uh, in fact, I've got the, the quizzes and everything else. I can get that to you. Uh, um, uh, if I do the pre quiz, let the kids do the VR simulation and, and then do you like I traditionally do, then I saw real big improvements in test scores, 50, 55%. Um, so that's probably the best way of doing it is combining um, new technology, VR, multiplayer, metaverses with traditional review seems to put gives us the biggest bang for the buck so to speak it's like it's like a prometheum active board you know it's a cool piece of technology but the teacher still needs to be there all right so this is what the chromebook version chromebook multiplayer version looks like not bad um on 3d web worlds so here i'm running around and I see a stegosaurus confronting an allosaurus and there were boxes under each dinosaur and if you actually go in there and try it, um, it's, these boxes are called Learn More. When you click on them, information pops up about each one of the dinosaurs. All right, so here's what's coming up for 2024. The Jurassic went off so well that I decided to do a late Cretaceous Sim plan for 2024 that should be released this summer um, in uh, Virginia. And... Uh, so far, the results have been really good. Um, I sent this simulation to Dr. Jordan Mallon at Alberta, Canada, who is one of the experts on Lake Cretaceous. He looked it over and said, your content is really good, dude. Dinosaurs look great. The landscape looks great. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Not a lot of changes. Um, so um, I'm really excited about this one. But I've got to make a VR version of it. I've got a multiplayer version of it. Um, I've just got to clean it up a little bit, but I think I'm in pretty good shape. And uh, Shiloh is raising her hand. I knew this was coming. Go ahead, Shiloh, what would you want to ask? Because I'm almost done with the, the content.
Uh, have you had interaction or feedback? I'm not sure. I understand. Yeah, I have had some feedback. I'm going to get to that in a minute. You know, one of, again, let's get back to the five C's. How do we use these simulations to get kids thinking critically? And uh, Dr. Mallon um, gave me this suggestion. He said, give the students a series of dinosaurs, a couple of dinosaurs like this, and then also give them a bunch of plants and say, which dinosaur do you think ate what plant? And it's a really simple answer to that. The height of the dinosaur, okay, controls what it can eat. So the ankylosaurs are pretty close to the ground, so they're feeding off most of the ferns. Triceratops is probably doing the same thing, although it had powerful beaks and probably could go after some of the tree trunks. And then orthopods, my gosh, they could um, eat just about anywhere they want from ferns all the way to the top. Uh, Supernova is asking, what were the main variables you were measuring? Uh, well, in the case of the museum, not much. It was just a demonstration. Um, in the case of the high school, I was looking at improvement or changes in test scores. And I know, Supernova, you're doing a, a grad school program. We, I can talk to you more about how this was done and set up. And in addition to the Lake Cretaceous, I'm also planning one for the Triassic. And uh, I was just talking with um, um, with Dr. with Jenny Borscht, who is the supervisor for Ghost Ranch down in New Mexico. That's very interested in this multiplayer program. So I've got to get together with her sometime. Um, and this one was uh, this program was developed over Christmas time because there were two young children in Arizona. Um, uh, Diego and Safira, and Diego just loved dinosaurs and wanted a pet dinosaur. So I worked this out where he could log into the software and type a letter of the alphabet like E for eat or D for drink, and the dinosaur would uh, execute the command. Uh, there was a really cool YouTube video I found that explained how to use animation controllers in Unity, and this was a lot of fun. Okay, and can add a lot to a simulation to have these to be able to interact with dinosaurs in different ways. All right, now I know what some of you are thinking about. Well, it sounds like you did all the work. Okay, what about um, what about student created content? Uh, feedback or interest from Argentina? Uh, uh, I no, I, I don't work with anybody in Argentina, uh, Shiloh. Okay, so here are some student-created virtual worlds, and let's see here. Marie is still in the audience, and I just co-taught. This is a high school uh, project of a Europa colony. Students at Colorado State University can kind of run around, and they can collect ice samples and rock samples and so on. And seems to be working well since we seem to do it every semester, um, every time Marie does her CSU class there. Um, I've had students work in Minecraft. I've had them. Yes, under I got to work in Minecraft. I can't just all be about um, uh, Unity. Um, what during COVID, I had a number of students doing projects for me in Minecraft. Very creative ones too. Uh, they were making like earthquake resistant houses. And I forget some of the other ways that they were using it. To me, um, Minecraft is the low hanging fruit. It's just, the kids love it. A lot of them already have it on their computers. Uh, it's just a quick, easy way to get kids creating um, online. Or 3D web worlds. I use that at my school to have students uh, and teams create. We did an ecology lab there. Ultimately, of course, I think. It's best to have students work up to Unity 3D since it's such a powerful tool, but obviously I am biased. Um, in terms of communication tools, as you know, Zoom is, seems to be the gold standard. Um, in world chat, Discord, even cell phones. Uh, another th big thing to talk about here is digital citizenship. Um, I think it's really crucial in this age to have works, avoid uploading viruses and malware, don't hack into other computers and so on. Uh, if schools fail, there's going to be problems. My principal regrettably ignored 
how good students were getting at his school in terms of skills until a student hacked into his laptop that he realized that this was a problem. And then all heck broke loose, and he was uh, uh, sick, the police on him, vandalizing bathrooms and so on. For those of you that are interested in this program, uh, please email me. Um, there's my email address, wjagenberg at gmail. I'm not quite clear at this point how to release some of these simulations. Some of them are still in, thank you, Electra, local chat. Uh, I'm still working with Dinosaur Ridge as to how they want this released. We've talked about, right now we're still in beta testing, so if you say you want to be a beta tester, you're going to get the program. Um, eventually, we're hoping that uh, people would download this and make maybe make donations to um, Dinosaur Ridge or some of the other organizations like the Virginia Museum. Um, we're not quite sure how this would be sold. Uh, right now, it's still beta testing and trying to move it and clean it up. All right, so final slide, um, final conclusion is that uh, um, metaverses can be created by educators in the classroom. Who, uh, that foster online collaboration and communication. These are student-centered. They are highly popular and middle school kids, um, and they can lead to significant improvement in test scores um, if uh, teachers uh, work with the students while they are in the, the metaverse environment. Um, we do need funding. Uh, this can't be done for because there are people like technicians that have to get paid, okay, for their time. Um, I think that's just fair. Um, the secrets for really great projects are scientists or, or content experts, educators, technicians, all working together, um, either during time or uh, at conferences like this one here. And I was asked about, did you get any feedback? Um, and my feedback from Dinosaur Festival in 2023 was, I wish my children were taught like this in schools, meaning a VR multiplayer virtual world. Kids got it, parents loved it, and with your help, um, with your help, okay, um, you know, we can make this a reality. And oh, yeah, I'm sorry, we ran over. Um, so we'll stop it at this point. Sorry.